Hello, this is Amy Robertson. I am the Science Coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And I want to welcome you today to this webinar entitled Detecting and Addressing Climate Change Impacts on Birds and Their Habitats in Northern Mexico and the Southwestern United States. We're very pleased to be bringing this to you today. The Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative has several teams that are functioning as applied science think tanks. They're addressing critical management questions of interest across the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative's geography in the desert southwest and northern Mexico. One of these teams, uh, which we call the Critical Management Question 2 team, is focused on assessing and addressing uh, the following questions. So what species and ecological processes are sensitive to climate change and other large-scale stressors and threats? For example, water management, invasive species, altered fire regimes. Um, and which of these can be effectively monitored to understand the overall effects of these stressors on ecosystems, habitats, and species, thus helping managers detect, understand, and respond to these changes? And then what are the best monitoring designs and protocols to detect changes to these processes and species at temporal and geographic scales suitable for providing adequate and reliable metrics for managers? So the presentation today and the project you're going to be learning about is being led by Point Blue Conservation Science and the Sonoran Joint Venture. And this project's been funded by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative as well as the Sonoran Joint Venture. And we're really excited about this tool, and in a minute you're going to see why. Um, we really think that this is going to be of great value um, to the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and the Joint Venture and our partners in conservation by helping us to understand the potential effects of climate change via ecosystem and habitat changes on birds. It will also help us to understand what needs to be monitored as these changes are occurring across the landscape so that we can all use that information to inform management decisions. So I want to introduce to you our critical management question number two. Um, one of the team leaders is Carol Beardmore, who is the science coordinator for the Sonoran Joint Venture and she's going to be introducing our presenter today. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everyone. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Sam Velos from Point Blue Conservation Science, formerly PRBO Conservation Science, even more formally, Point, Point Reyes for Conservation. Um, Sam primarily works on projects that explore how species respond to global change, including climate change and other human modifications. He uses models that test the sensitivity of species to changing environmental conditions. And he evaluates what species or places might be most vulnerable to global change. He is a member of the Climate Change and Informatics Group at Point Blue, and in that he works to develop tools, frameworks, and techniques for transforming the scientific data compiled by Point Blue and partners into successful conservation outcomes. Sam received his PhD in ecology from UC Davis and his BA in environmental studies from UC Santa Cruz. Um, at this point, Sam, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Carol. Um, I really uh, want to thank um, for everyone for the invitation to give the talk today. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, excited to, to share some of the, the work that we've been uh, working on for the last couple of years um, in partnership, especially with the Sonoran Joint Venture. Um, so with that, um, I want to start off with a little bit of introduction on the project um, and, and kind of quickly go over what our project goals were, are, and um, the, the main one is really we really want to develop some tools that could build the capacity of managers in the U.S. and Mexico to really understand what sorts of changes are in store from climate change and what are the changes we might see from habitats as well as uh, bird populations. At the same time, we, we wanted this to be um, develop a set of tools that, where we could actually help deliver the science to managers. Um, we wanted to create a mechanism for giving um, easy, straightforward access to, to model outputs and, and hopefully 
um, along the way have a dialogue between the science we're doing and the managers so that uh, the tools we create are actually used um, um, and result in actual conservation out outcomes. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we really wanted these tools to help um, establish a broad scale coordinated bird, vegetation, and, and climate monitoring effort throughout our study region. Um, so, and, and, you know, this, this monitoring effort really should be focused on um, developing climate, climate change adaptation efforts. Um, but through that also, um, we would have a feedback loop where it's improving the, the modeling that we're doing and hopefully then that will lead to, to better conservation outcomes in the future. Um, Carol mentioned sort of our history. I just wanted to make sure folks know who uh, we are uh, with Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, we were founded in 1963 out in uh, Point Reyes as the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. Um, we have a long history of collecting um, bird observations, developing bird monitoring protocols. Uh, but especially in the last um, 15 to 20 years, um, we've really uh, been shifting our focus and um, in, in being a little more holistic in terms of looking at uh, ecosystem-wide um, conservation issues, still focusing um, and maintaining our expertise in bird monitoring and, and bird science, but um, really using birds as indicators to give us a better sense of overall um, ecosystem-wide resilience and health. Um, and, and, and I should mention, so yes, as, uh, we did change our name just this last year to Point Blue Conservation Science, and I think that really reflects, you know, our work not just now focused on the Bay Area, but uh, we are doing work all the way up um, into um, along the California current up into Alaska, and, and actually quite a bit of work going on down in Antarctica. So, and as you'll see today, much of our modeling um, uh, covering all, uh, most of the western U.S. at this point. Um, this project sort of got started uh, based on work we had done in California, uh, looking at um, the breeding distribution of birds uh, throughout the state in response to climate change. And uh, those model outputs um, you're seeing here on the left, um, changes of species richness with one of those models. And then um, on the right, sort of the n number of no analog communities that we expect to see in the future under this model. And no analog future, those, those dark red colors means that these are combinations of species occurring in a community that, that we don't see on the landscape today. And one of the big points, or you know, one of the things, glaring patterns you see is this dark red area down in the southeast of California. And, and a big question is, you know, is this a pattern we might expect to see in the future, these, these no analog communities in the deserts of California, or is that an artifact of our study boundary, the fact that, you know, we are using the, the, the boundary of California. Um, and if we had actually included species coming from the desert coming in, maybe the, these no analog communities are actually communities that exist in other places. And so, um, uh, so, so talking with our partners at the Sonoran Joint Venture, we, we really wanted to explore that idea and, and, and really think, you know, what we need to do is, is look at the larger landscape and, get, and um, account for the fact that species will be moving, um, tracking favorable climate conditions across this larger landscape. And, and we don't know exactly what direction they might be, go, be going to. Um, and so that's, that was sort of one of the, the um, inspirations for getting this project going. But then also the, the fact that really we want to get a coordinated monitoring effort going across this larger landscape. Um, how will we know, you know, we can produce these models looking at how uh, climate's going to change and what the impacts might be, but how will we know if those are right if we're not out um, monitoring those changes? Um, if we don't have ways to attribute the changes that we see. So well, how can we um, use this information to help design that monitoring effort in the future? Well, to, b to build the models um, that I'm going to be showing you today, the first step is we really needed data across this larger landscape. Um, Point Blue has been um, doing a lot of work gathering data in California, and, and we have others working, um, partners working in the, the Great Basin and the Desert Southwest. but um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have uh, the great network um, covering this larger region that we would like to have. So that was really the first step. 
And the first part of the talk, that, or the second part where I'm going to go into, is really talking about that data collection aspect and, and, and the creation of these, what I'm going to be terming uh, a node um, as part of the avian knowledge network. Thanks, Sam. This is Amy. I'm going to interrupt you just sure. for a moment and remind folks to go ahead and mute your phones um, unless you end up having a call, uh, question at the end, okay? We're getting some background noise. So if you're not the speaker or you're not asking a question at the end, please be on mute. Thanks so much. Sorry, Sam. No problem. Thanks. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Avian Knowledge Network right now. And uh, the Avian Knowledge Network is a network um, of um, um, nonprofits, government organizations, and those just interested in bird conservation. And it arose sort of um, out of the acknowledgement that there's a lot of uh, individual studies going on across the United States, but you know, the, just by the fact that it, you can't be monitoring everywhere, and um, we recognize that you know by putting together all these um, individual um, monitoring efforts, we could be getting, probably be learning a lot more collectively from all of the data. So uh, at the one hand, this is a problem in terms of trying to integrate data from many different studies, but it's a great opportunity where we really could be learning a lot more about birds um, and their responses to environmental change across this greater landscape. So the Avian Knowledge Network is really this, this um, network of users, node partners, and data providers. And so data providers might be anybody who's collecting um, bird or environmental observations, um, breeding bird surveys, bird observatories, um, e-birders, or just other researchers out collecting data. So you can col um, contribute data to the network, and then you, but then you really want to um, think about these, these different nodes, and I have a, different, a few examples here of what we mean by that. And California Point Blue has really um, established a node um, called the California Avian Data Center, um, CADC there in that little icon. Um, but there are other nodes um, across the U.S. Um, the Midwest Avian Data Center has been developed and has been expanding. And these nodes are really, um, although there may be one um, individual group sort of hosting the node, it's really about partnerships. It's about um, groups coming together and, and um, identifying a need of um, uh, um, issues that you want to be addressing and um, really working together to, devel to develop these nodes. And then, of course, you have users. And so these could be people who are um, uh, looking at the data, um, looking at products derived from the data, um, many, many other uses. So um, really quickly, um, what, what do I mean by the data life cycle? Well, of course, there are those of us out collecting data and doing monitoring. Um, and, and that's, you know, basically we, that's the starting point. We can't do any of these models or um, any of the analysis that we would like to do without collecting that data. But then we need to um, put it somewhere. And, and the, the idea of this avian knowledge network is that it's stored in a place that's accessible to all. Now, you can, as a contributor, you can decide to, to either, you know, make your data accessible or um, keep it, um, you know, uh, under permissions where, you know, only people can see it if you, they have permission. It, it's sort of up to you. We have different levels. But the, the great thing is that the data is stored, it's curated, um, and, and so, um, and, and potentially available to integrate into many larger studies. Um, we have built-in tools to help you analyze the data, but like I said, having the data sort of collected in this network, it allows for analysis that really um, can cover a much broader geographic and temporal scope than would be available to individuals alone. And finally, having that data gives you the ability to, to, to create tools that then can deliver the science to people in a more usable fashion. So it's really the way that, that we can help create these derived products, and that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking about mostly today are, are, are these products that we can um, help to create to help deliver the science that wouldn't be possible without um, collecting data from these, these different studies. Um, I want to briefly mention how this, we see this as really fitting into the adaptive management cycle. Um, you know, we have the data collection and management, but then once the data is there, um, partnerships can emerge where we, where partners in a region, for example, in the, the desert southwest, um, 
you know, maybe partners identified by the Desert LCC or the joint ventures can come up with questions that, um, you know, you might identify tools that would really help answer questions of conservation concern. And then, and, and of course, that that should then directly um, help support management, and then that would feed back into more data collection and et cetera as part of the cycle. But I really wanted to emphasize that, that the, the, these, the management and, and decision support creation really ought to be um, coming out of partnerships where um, it's not just these one-off tools that are good for answering one question, but it really should be um, the partnerships identifying questions uh, as a group that, that need to be solved. Um, so, so what do you need to establish a node? Well, you know, do you have specific conservation issues? For example, impacts of climate change on forests in Mexico. Um, are, or is there a specific management question? Um, what action should I take? Do nothing, uh, restore or increase protection to protect the golden cheek warbler, for example. And, and then what data is available? What tools are needed? And who makes these de decisions? And so um, by having a node, it, it sort of facilitates this partnership of identifying these questions, these needs, and working together to come up with funding to, to help create these products. Okay, so that's sort of the background um, for, you know, we identified sort of the need to collect data to do this, this project. Um, now I'm going to get into a little more of the details on, on the models that we, we created to get at how can we estimate what is the vulnerability to climate change in the, in the desert southwest region. Um, to start off, uh, we, we decided to look at four different future climate models, and we, we tried to grab a few that really spanned uh, the range of, of uh, projected future climate um, in this period about mid mid-century 2041 to 2060, and each of these models used uh, the IPCC4 higher emission scenario, the A2 emission scenario. Um, for the bird models, you know, we started out hoping and really working to go out and collect um, bird observation data from partners and organizations. Jenny Duberstein with the Sonoran Joint Venture really led the effort to, to um, reach out to partners and, and um, have them contribute data for this modeling effort, and she was really successful. However, we did realize pretty quickly that, that there just wasn't much data available, particularly in, in parts of Mexico. Um, and so we really had to turn to um, citizen science data, so eBird and Aberabis for Mexico. Um, uh, and including that data we found was really helped improve the, the models that I'll be showing. Um, as part of the bird models, we really also wanted to include vegetation. And uh, I'll go into details a little more, but just to, to mention now that uh, we used uh, satellite um, uh, vegetation maps created from the spot satellite um, using a, their, the classification system um, from the spot satellite. And then we put all this data together in um, habitat suitability models. Um, we used the Maxent algorithm, um, and we modeled uh, 67 different bird species. Those species were, were chosen as sort of um, indicators of different habitat types. Um, here's a, a subset of the types um, we focused on, riparian forest, con coniferous forest, et cetera. Um, but really, the, the, the species were chosen, A, you know, did we have data on those species, but also um, are they good indicators of the quality and, and quantity of the, these specific habitats? And you'll notice some some of the habitats are have more species than others, but um, we we did a, a I think a pretty good job of of getting a broad range of habitats reflected um, in the species we included. Now, as I said, um, we we wanted to include vegetation as a um, parameter in our in our bird distribution models. And that became a real challenge um, from the outset of the project because, um, particularly because of the border issue, where uh, we have certain, you know, uh, high levels uh, of vegetation classification, um, the national classification system for the U.S., but that doesn't exist down into Mexico. And so, what do we do? We we needed a consistent vegetation classification across the whole study region. Um, the other thing is um, we wanted to pick sort of vegetation types that were meant something to managers. And so that we, we explored several options. Um, 
got a lot of feedback, particularly from our partners with the Sonoran Joint Venture, and we settled on this um, spot vegetation map. And so you can sort of see the, the types of vegetation that were included in the model. We, as a first step, we had to, to then model how that vegetation might change into the future. And so what we did was actually uh, model each of those vegetation types separately. And here I'm I'm showing um, an example of needle-leaved evergreen forest. Uh, and uh, on, in the bottom left panel there, you see uh, the um, the spot remote sensing map, and it, the, the vegetation type is sort of this dark green. Um, on the in the top left panel is is the the predicted probability of occurrence of that type um, under current climate conditions, and we're including um, not just climate but also soil characteristics, um, some topographic characteristics. Um, but also cl the climate variables we did include are those that we sort of hypothesized would have a bigger effect on vegetation, um, so that that would span sort of the whole annual range. Um, so then on the top, in the the um, top right is the model prediction for, under this climate model, then CAR CCSM3, how that vegetation would occur in the future, and the bottom right is sort of the the difference between the current and the future. So reds are where we predict declines in the probability of occurrence, and, and blues were where we predict increases, and the white sort of where there, we don't predict a whole lot of change. Um, so we did this for each of the different um, vegetation types, and then those become covariates in our, our bird distribution models. Well, so I, I mentioned at the beginning that um, one of the goals was to really um, estimate the vulnerability of, of bird species to climate change, and, and probably most of you on the phone know that, that when we say vulnerability, we're typically talking about three components, um, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So the first part of that exposure um, is really looking at the, the climate variables. Now, for the birds, you know, these are, many of these are migratory birds, and we are going to be modeling their breeding distribution. So, um, you know, so some of the birds are only in the region for part of the year, and they're, of course they're only breeding for part of the year. So we wanted to look at climate variables that actually were associated with those time periods. So we broke, um, we actually created um, different seasons, I'll call them, but they're different, essentially four-month blocks where we looked at sort of the average temperature over those blocks, the, the temperature range, the, the difference between maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures, and then the, the, the precipitation over that, that period. And so you can see in these three plots, um, the black in each one is sort of the historic levels, and then uh, each of the other colors represent the different um, future models. Um, one, one thing you, I'll just sort of pull out here is this, you know, these, these models always have these sort of meaningless acronyms, um, but the, the MIROC 3.2 MEDREZ model turns out to be a sort of a hot model and also um, a drier model um, compared to the others. You know, any, in, in this panel on the right, anything that's below the black line is drier than current. Anything above it is, is wetter. So the, this green curve is sort of one of the hottest models and then um, one of the driest models. Um, 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 uh, compared to the NCAR model, which again is a, is a pretty hot model, um, all of the models show increased temperatures in the future. There's a consensus there, but uh, with precipitation, we we do see some disagreement. Well, the NCAR model actually um, projects a wetter future, um, especially later in the season. Um, but it's it's so it's sort of a hot wet model. Um, and then then we have some differences where we might have some you know warm. Some of the models kind of have similar precipitation. Um, and, and so we, they sort of represent a range of potential futures. All of these are kind of plausible futures for the region. Um, so I recommend that, that people kind of, um, rather than trying to think of a mean future, think of um, each of these as a plausible uh, future that you might want to plan for. We can actually put all that information together into a map to get at this exposure question. And this is a map I created thinking of the exposure to birds. So. Um, it's taking one of those future climate models, looking at um, the different, each of those climate variables, looking at the change in each of those climate variables, and also looking at the change in predicted vegetation um, 
at each pixel. And so what you're seeing here is a map where red colors indicate where we're really predicting a lot of climate and vegetation change in the future. And blue colors are where the sort of the magnitude of change is not quite as great. And so you can sort of see the spatial variability of where we, where there are hot spots of change and, and where change isn't projected to be quite so much. Um, the units here are standardized Euclidean distance. So it's, it's just the Euclidean distance between all of those um, variables standardized by the spatial, spatial variability. But just keep in mind that, you know, warmer colors mean more change. Cooler colors are sort of less of a change. And so we can, we can use this sort of information to then um, help us in um, estimating that, that final vulnerability. Okay, so the, the next um, piece of the, the vulnerability index is really getting at sensitivity. Um, so for that, we wanted to look at, well, what are the changes in the bird distributions across the landscape? And so what, how do we do that? Well, we take, this is just an example um, from the San Francisco Bay, but the concept is the same, where we take observational data um, from the species. In this case, like I said, it's a combination of more, more standardized monitoring protocols and um, citizen science data. We put that together with environmental data, and then we make predictions, uh, spatial predictions of occurrence across the landscape. So we can summarize um, those models um, sort of by these different guilds, habitat guilds that I mentioned. And here I'm just showing um, two, uh, two of the different guilds that we looked at. And, and so the y-axis in these, these plots is just the percent change in suitability um, from, from current, so between the difference between future and current. And um, each of the lines is one of the different future climate models, and the error bars sort of re reflect the variability among the species within those guilds. But I want to point out that in, in both of these guilds, you'll notice that they do tend, the, the results here show that they are sensitive to climate change in that um, the curves really are different depending on um, which climate model we throw at them. So again, you know, under the, that drier, hot, dry climate model, the green one here, we see for the coniferous species um, pretty much a consistent decline in suitability across the, and this, this is summarized across the desert LCC region. So um, a decline in those species is projected. Um, whereas, you know, the, in the NCAR, the, that hot, wet model, um, for desert grassland species, we're actually, it's projecting increases. Um, so, it, you know, you, you, and, and then you see differences across the different models. So they do, uh, many of these species do, you know, not surprisingly, do um, seem to be sensitive to climate change. We can also just, you know, take, take a look at a similar graph, but uh, on a species level. So here's just one species, and again, the um, here now the, the y-axis is actual the suitability summarized across the desert LCC, the mean suitability. And so the black line is, um, shows how the suitability changes across the different seasons in the model um, for historic conditions. And then um, anything below the black line then in, indicates a decline in suitability. And um, in this one region early on, we actually see um, for that, that hot, wet model an increase in suitability. So um, again, uh, differences, in, in this case, it's, it's both differences in the magnitude of suitability, but also um, different patterns, um, temporal patterns of su suitability projected in the future. But we can also look at that um, as a map on the landscape. So here, for the same species, I'm, I'm just plotting the, the suitability, um, I'll go back one, um, at this peak, sort of the peak suitability, March through June, um, under current conditions, and that's what it looks like. And so you can see in the desert LCC region, sort of in the north, central north part of the region, where we're projecting, you know, the most suitable habitat. Um, when we look, I'm going to show you then results from this green curve, so sort of the, the worst, in some ways, the worst case scenario for, for this species. Um, you see declines in suitability at that same time um, period in the future, particularly in the, the, the desert LCC region. The, the, up in California, there are changes. I go back and forth a little bit, but not quite as extreme. There's still quite a bit of suit ha suitable habitat available. So we're not seeing a complete loss for the species, but definitely a, a decline um, in the, the area of suitable habitat um, under this particular climate model. So that's just one example. 
the problem is, you know, it's, it's kind of hard when we have 67 different species and five future climate models. Sometimes it's hard to put together that information and, and make that useful for coming up with a monitoring plan. So another way we can um, put that information together is to look at community level changes for the birds. And so here I'm just taking, calculating um, jacquard distance, um, sort, sort of a um, distance in the community composition between current and future. Um, so um, yellow, the, the greens and yellows indicate those are pixels that we predict, you know, bigger changes, bigger turnover in the bird community at those sites, the blue areas where we're not predicting quite as much turnover. And so these sorts of, you know, models where we integrate the information might be useful. Maybe we, we can use those to start coming up with both hy hypotheses for, for what the change might be, but also maybe we can actually use these to help design our future monitoring protocols. Maybe we want to look at those places where change is predicted to be greatest and, and focus our monitoring, but also maybe focus on areas where, you know, change isn't supposed to be great. Maybe these are refugia for certain, for certain species or guilds. We can also look at changes in richness, so maybe it's not quite the 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 community composition you're you're interested in, but but overall changes in, in the richness on the pixel level. And so here, under that same model where we're predicting declines in species richness, um, dark blue is where we might expect to see increases in species richness. Okay, so that I think those um pieces will help us get at the the, the sensitivity um, the one piece that I think often get, goes missing in, in looking at vulnerability is the adaptive capacity. And um, one thing we, we sort of, uh, sort of a problem we came upon um, at the beginning of our project was we realized that many of these species breed um, at different time periods um, in different regions of our study area. So, um, for example, here um, the, in the blue, um, and the, the hatched um, sort of polygon represents the breeding range of the species. The blue indicates that it, in this area, it tends to breed, you know, between March and June. But up in California, it breeds later in, in April to July. So the question became sort of what led us to look at these different time periods: is well, what period do we mo we model for the future, and what what would happen because they're already sort of. Um, exhibiting some plasticity in their, their the timing of breeding, what would happen if they changed their breeding in the future? So we decided to model each of these periods so that we could perhaps show, you know, do these birds have an adaptive capacity to change both where they're breeding but also when they're breeding? Um, <coughs> we wanted to look at that those possibilities. So here I'll just give an example um, where where at least the models demonstrate that, that there might actually be this possibility. So again, the, the black curve shows the historic suitability. And what we see is, you know, um, uh, early on, uh, there's sort of less suitable habitat in the desert LCC, but suitability really in increases to a peak around March through June and then declines um, as we move towards summer. Well, um, focusing in on that high, hot, dry model again, um, what we see is sort of a similar pattern of, of suitability increasing, but it, it reaches a peak um, a bit earlier in that February to May period, um, and then actually declines um, in the uh, relative to current um, at the peak season of March through June. So could this be that, you know, um, it might make more sense for the species or the conditions might be conducive for them to start breeding earlier in the de desert LCC in the future? Um, you know, th uh, four of the models here sort of, sort of show that pattern. So um, might that be something we want to um, change our monitoring for? You know, we, we might be sort of in a pattern where we're going out to monitor species at a given time period, but maybe we want to be looking. I think um, just I know from talking to friends who live in Tucson, um, they were noting a lot of birds showing up at, at, at time periods this year given the drought. Um, and given the you know the the warm winter that we're having um, during periods that they don't normally occur there, so might this be what we expect to see in the future that the birds have this adaptive capacity to both change their this where they're breeding but also when they're breeding, and so we can look at how that changes. So here I'm just going to show you um, the current dis the breeding distribution for each of those periods. So this is 
Um, so I'll start, you know, looking at January to April and then and sort of flip through. And so what we can see is so suitability increasing and, and moving north as we move towards the spring. And this is where we that, – that, that peak suitability for the desert LCC region in, in March to, to June. But then as we move towards spring, um, suitability really starts to increase up in California and, and then starts declining in the, the desert LCC region. So that's how the changes go. Well, how, how might that change in the future? So again, I'll just flip through. And we can see already um, in that January to April period that there's already a little more suitable habitat predicted um, on the right in the future climate model, in that hot, dry climate model. And then as we predict, go forward at, to this time step into February to April, there's quite a bit more. And this is sort of the peak under this climate model in the desert LCC region um, in the future whereas it hasn't quite hit the peak yet um, over under current conditions in the, in the left. Um, March to June, there's still actually this, what's, what's available is highly predicted to be highly suitable, but overall um, we see uh, declines um, in this region. Um, and then we can see how it, it, it changes forward into the future. And in both models, again, we see declines as we go towards spring and summer, but increases up in California, maybe not quite so much um, sort of less suitability predicted in the future model for California and, and Baja California. Okay, so, so that's sort of what the, the models um, predict and, and the sensitivities that they show. But how do we then take this information um, and make it useful to managers? How, how do we outreach and, and connect with the managers? And so we've developed um, an online tool. Um, I've put the URL up there, and it'll be up there for a second if you want to jot it down. It's, it's still in beta um, version because what we're one of the things we're doing right now is trying to reach out to managers and, and potential users and get feedback on, on whether this tool is actually useful or not, or how could it be improved. Um, some of the features of the tool that I'll highlight, um, you can select the different habitat types that I've been uh, mentioning, the different guilds. and once you do that, then you'll get a, a, a selection of species that are sort of indicators for that habitat type, and you can pick the species that, of interest. You can look at either the present conditions or the future, um, each of those different future climate models. But then you can also look at, select those different um, breeding windows um, that I was showing. And then you can have the map, the, the sort of the inset map on the right here, tells you, well, at least under current conditions, where are they breeding and what time period do they breed in, in those regions. And so you can, that can hopefully be helpful to, to think about which, ones, which periods you want to look at. We also give some information on the models, um, what, which variables were actually came out as most important for predicting the distribution um, under the current conditions. So um, we found that, that managers tend to find that information um, useful in thinking about how they can manage to create or or at least um, promote habitat for the species of question. Um, a couple, couple other features um, that I didn't create arrows for, but there is this piece here where you can download the data. This, this, um, you can do it through directly through this map window where whatever map you're, whatever raster you're looking at here, if you hit the download bit, um, data button, you, you'll actually be able to download um, the GIS data for that model. But we also have. Um, the download model results where you can go in and, and sort of select the ones you want to look at um, uh, through that interface as well. But we didn't just want to create a tool, put it out there, and, and hope folks would use it. So we've also um, gone now to two different workshops, one in um, Chiapas and one in Tucson, where we sat down with folks, created some exercises um, to sort of walk people through using the tool, and, and got some information that we're now using to, to upgrade it and hopefully make it more useful. Um, we also really are, are interested in getting um, trying to uh, get the de um, development of a node for the avian knowledge network. Um, we think that would really be valuable for the, the desert southwest and in Mexico. Um, that, and that I think will really help in the development of a, um, developing a coordinated monitoring effort um, so that we can really you know, have it more focused on it, um, identifying these potential climate change impacts. 
So just to give a, um, in each of those different workshops, we had about 15 participants in each. Those included representatives from NGOs and government, as well as university students and professors. So like I said, we created these exercises online. Um, that they're still available, so if there's interest, I can uh, share the links to these exercises. Um, but they work through them, and so then through that process, we get a sense for, well, what part of the tools were useful? Where where did the where was the information confusing? Where did people not know what to do? And so hopefully, this we can use this information to really um, improve the tool, but also figure out the types of questions um, that people could be addressing um, with the tool. So what did we, we learn at those workshops? Well, th that there definitely is this interest in developing a regional node for the desert southwest, um, and, and that, that the resulting data and models could be helpful for coordinated conservation planning. Um, so there is this interest, and, and so I think that's really, you know, potentially something that the um, an, a group like the Desert LCC or the Joint Ventures could be helping um, get a node like that established. Um, we also got a lot of feedback on the, the functionality um, of the tool, and, re and one of the things um, that the users identified is that it's a lot of information, but it's difficult to really pull out the pieces that they should be focusing on for management. So we need to work on summarizing the data in ways that um, really could be useful. So that's one of the pieces that I'm working on now. Our team is working right. on trying to trying to summarize the data in, that, in ways that really will help people um, digest the information better. Also, there was this sort of momentum uh, for a, a 2014 workshop focused on data management for the region, and I'll talk a little more about that in a sec. So um, in terms of next steps, um, what, we're what we're planning on is convening an expert workshop um, in the fall of 2014, and I, I think we agreed upon Phoenix. Um, but, but the the idea here is we can use these models that we've developed, use the tool to develop a coordinated monitoring program to look at the, to um, uh, identify and attribute the effects of climate change um, within the region. We also want to ha help these vet, uh, experts help vet the models that we have. Um, perhaps identify how they could be improved or, or, you know, what's the next set of models that we should be looking at? Where are the big data gaps um, that we need to address, maybe through the monitoring or potentially new modeling efforts? And get some more input on um, improving the functionality of the tool. So this is something we envision as being sort of a living, a living creature that, that you know, continually is improved over time. And then in the um, spring of 2015, we're hoping to convene a workshop where uh, we look at, uh, we bring together, it's more of a training workshop and, and, and looking at um, how the monitoring, uh, training um, resource managers and scientists on how to implement that monitoring program. So um, I'm actually, I'm just about done here and I might ask uh, Jenny Duberstein to, to, if she wants to add anything um, to those workshops. Jenny, did you want to? Did it? Did, how did I do? <laughs> um, I think you did a great job. You covered it really well. And yeah, I don't have much to add. If anybody's interested in any of those things, you can get in touch with Sam or me or Carol. Or um, we'd love to give you more detail. I guess for the monitoring, just I, maybe I will add just a couple. The the ideas of what we're thinking are what are what are the sorts of we're thinking of stuff that is. Um, fairly low cost to implement that doesn't require a great deal of, of expertise or knowledge um, because particularly um, in Mexico, there just aren't a whole lot of biologists to do this work and there's um, even less funding to do this work than there is in the U.S. and there's, as we all know, not enough in the U.S. But looking at things, identifying priority species, um, gathering basic climate information, temperature, precipitation, maybe looking at um, changes in distributions of invasive plants, things like snags, nectar plants, um, and some other more broad phenology data. But basically we're, we're talking about a, a program that is fairly straightforward to, to implement and that ideally would perhaps fit into existing monitoring programs um, so we're not developing something entirely new, say for a, a national park that already has or a refuge that already is already doing monitoring, but it's something that, that fits like a puzzle piece against uh, what they currently have. Great. 
Great. And so with that, I just wanted to definitely give a, a, a big thank you to especially to all the folks that contributed data um, to this project, but also other partners um, who have supported our work, um, particularly the, the joint venture and the Desert LCC and the Fish and Wildlife Service for providing funding for the project, um, as well as other partners that have sort of helped in the creating the infrastructure that allows the creation of these tools. And uh, with that, I think, um, I'll just say thanks, and I'm happy to take any and all questions. Great. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, this is such a great tool, and I'm just really impressed with all the um, thought um, that has gone into this, and I, I look forward to um, seeing more partners start to use it and get engaged with developing it. Very exciting. So I want to open it up for questions. Does anyone have a question for Sam? Hi, hi, Dwayne Poole with Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. I saw that you had five climate models that you'd used for, for doing this, and I like the idea that you have a, a, a suite of climate models that you're evaluating. But my question for you is, how did you come down to that particular subset of models from the 20 plus that are available? Yeah, um, what we did was to, to sort of look at, um, we did some quick summaries of the climate information um, and I, I think we did that, this is a few years ago now, so I'm digging back the cobwebs, but I, what I think we did was looked at just the course level predictions and tried to, to get a range of models um, for, the, for, the, for that future time period, so, um, and, and that emission scenario, that one emission scenario, so tried to get sort of a, a, a spread, um, so it was a reasonable a range. Minute. Spread. Okay. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to um, we're trying to maximize the spread rather than try to. I mean, yeah, not look at an agreement exactly. Thanks. Um, Thanks, uh, Can I ask the question? Please. Okay. My name is uh, Patricia Feria from the University of Texas Pan American. So um, uh, I was in CHAP as I have opportunity to actually attend for uh, uh -huh. I think that might remember me. But anyway, so. I had more or less uh, related questions to the methods and uh, uh, that was used. I find it very interesting. So one of your assumptions is that the habitat loss or transformation is going to keep the same rate. I'm sorry, the, the, the habitat what? I missed the second part of the question. Habitat loss or transformation is going to be at the same rate. Is the, is the, I mean, that is one of the assumptions, right, because it might be changing. but you, you are taking what we have right now as the, the map uh, uh, of vegetation and then use your models, your five different uh, uh, general circulatory models to, to predict suitable habitat where they are going to be. I mean, suitable areas where are, this type of vegetations are going to remain. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and and so there it is. Um, yeah, there are some big assumptions there. Um, we're not incorporating mechanisms of change. So the, you know, we're just doing two snapshots in time. Um, there's nothing about disturbance that might you know. So so climate might not be suitable for plants to um, recruit or you know regenerate, but a, adult long-lived species might stick around um, in that unsuitable habitat unless you have some disturbance, right? So that those sort of processes are definitely not included in the model. Um, so yes, that's right. Um, it, and and it and we really don't include rates like you mentioned. Again, these are just two snapshots in time um, and. Some of those dynamics, dispersal, competition, um, of course, m are going to be really important. But yeah, they're they're not incorporated into these models. So how do you? I, I have just a, a, a couple of questions more if I have time for this. But how did you see? I, I saw that you use e, e birds and averabes uh, yes. uh, databases, but you didn't incorporate the databases like uh, GV, Remive, or that exist. How this can actually? Uh, change the, the models that you are producing because um, we have other databases available also to incorporate into the um, construction of the model? Um, that's a good question. Um, we could look, um, you know, I think it, can, it kind of comes down to, um, well, a time in terms of a lot of the, the data that you might get from GBRIF, BIF museum data um, um, for, the, um, you know, for the birds. 
um, there, there has to be a bit of data processing in terms of a lot of the spatial resolution is not great. Um, sometimes there are errors. And we just, you know, didn't necessarily have the time to do that and didn't think that it was um, getting us much more than we were already getting from the data we had. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not discounting that that data has been shown to be valuable uh, in these types of models. So um, it is a, something we could potentially look at, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that selecting some species and probably running with this other data and showing that the data you have, uh, the models you produce with this data doesn't really have like a significant difference with models using uh, additional information. I think that would be very useful. Yeah. But uh, the last question I have in terms of max sense, did you set for default the pa the, all the parameters to run the models, or did you play with the beta one? Uh, uh, um, yeah. No. No. We um, we didn't. We didn't. We don't typically use the default. Um, so one of the main, um, one of the big things we don't do is um, we don't let Maxent randomly choose the background. We actually use because th there's definitely a lot of spatial bias in terms of bo both the, the more standardized data we included, but also uh, definitely the, the citizen science data has a spatial bias to it, and we wanted the background data to sort of reflect that same spatial bias. Um, we've also played around with the regular, regularization features that sort of make the models less tight fitting. We, we kind of let them be a little a looser so that um, the models aren't overfitting the data too much. Um, those are just two of the, so, so yeah, we actually kind of um, um, tinker around under the hood quite a bit. So I imagine that was the same for the evaluation. You don't use the internal RUC, the IUC to do the evaluations, or you also or you do that? Um, I, we actually did one round, and I, and I don't have the data here in front of me, but we created one set of models with the EBER data and then evaluated them with the, the standardized data, um, since that data tends to be presence absence data, so you can get a better sense of, and, and the models did pretty well. I, again, I, I didn't. I don't have those figures in front of me what they were, but um, we actually started out with a longer list of species and, and excluded those that didn't perform very well. Um, we also have shown these um, models around to experts and, and gotten some feedback on, on the models from them. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for those great questions. Um, Sam, I have a question in the chat. Um, does, the, does this modeling include Nevada, or is there a plan to include Nevada in it? Um, it, it does include part of the Great Basin, but no, we, um, we were, we sort of, um, we actually applied for a national LCC grant and we had been hoping to expand into Nevada and include all of the Great Basin, um, and we unfortunately didn't get that funding. So it's, it's, um, we've been in, um, we've been in discussions trying to expand a little more, but no, at this point, um, we didn't have that funding and we were able to, to do California and, and some of the, North Pacific LCC because we'd been um, funded um, through the North Pacific LCC and so we sort of had a lot of the data already in hand to, to do those models but um, didn't have it for the for Nevada but would love to. <laughs> um, hi Sam, this is I didn't ask that question. My name is Chris Tomlinson. I'm in Nevada. Could it be expanded into at least BCR 33, the Mojave Desert in southern Nevada, or is, did that not I, get I, looked at as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly could, um, you know, especially if the the species we've modeled and the range of conditions, you know, is, in the area we've modeled is representative of, of that space, um, you know, we we definitely could. Because you have parts of BCR 33 and the Mojave Deserts in BCR 33 on the northern portion, so, I mean, at least for the... DLCC, that's the planning area, I believe. So yeah, yeah. It's not the Great Basin, but it's, it's right. At least in the Mojave in there. All of that BCR. Yeah, yeah. No, it it definitely. Um, you know, we we would love to to expand the region even more. It just comes down to, um, yeah, time and money. Unfortunately, um, just as you can probably imagine, even the huge regions that we have, the computer processing alone is is, is uh, very expensive and. Uh, so just you know, even adding a little more area is is always a challenge. But we would, again, we'd love to do it. Sam, this is Dwayne Poole again. Hey, I really like the approach. I really like the idea of the tool. 
my question when you get basically to the tool is twofold. One, have you looked at uh, the the different guilds or, or habitat-based groups of species to see which the models are performing better for or whether there's a confidence associated with those suites of species? And if so, have you started to identify the parameters that would make the data going into the model and those potential predictions for those species better so that we can start to think about what those next steps are in terms of creating data that makes tools like this perform better? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, again, we, we did do some evaluation statistics on the models, and, and all of the species we included um, were those that did pretty well. We, we sort of dropped the ones that were bad, um, and I don't think we – bother to look and say, you know, we're, we're some of the ones that were bad, did they tend to be in, in certain habitat types? Um, so we, we could go back and look, you know, with the ones we kept, um, if there are any differences, although I, I, I think, at least in the way we evaluated them, that they, they were all performed pretty well, so I'm not sure there's enough differences there, but I really like your idea of, of trying to drill in a little more and identify what, you know, what parameters were really important and um, how the models can be improved. There are definitely limitations that we had to deal with with the models. For example, um, w w although we had pretty good hydro hydrological data for the U.S., we couldn't find comparable data for Mexico, which meant that we just had to leave some of those crucial variables out of the models because, you know, it doesn't make sense to include the variable for, for half of your study region. Um, so, you know, if we had that sort of information, you know, more detailed uh, maps of where riparian areas are, maybe when the, when those areas actually have water and when they don't, I'm, I, I would expect that the models would get a whole lot better. So I know just right off the bat that that would be um, a big area for improvement. Uh, but I'm sure there are others. And I think um, one of the ways that I, you know, I, I think that we could um, improve it is through the sort of dialogue where we're actually sitting down and, and getting feedback from people who know um, what's going on on the ground. Um, um, I think we could learn a lot from just that discussion. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I have one. Oh, does somebody else want to talk? Go ahead. Well, this is this is Laurie Simons. I'm in. I'm the Southern Nevada question. <laughs> I'm here at the Desert Refuge Complex here in Southern Nevada, and um, you know the question came up about whether the Mojave in the in the Nevada could be included, and that would be interesting um, for for one kind of general reason, which is that a lot of a lot of um, ecologists are really interested in ecotones as places where climate change will be more detectable, the effects of climate change. Um, and so uh, when I was looking at your maps, it kind of looks like you have, you're predicting more change around the edges of, of your, your analysis area. And I was wondering if you thought that was the case where you'll see kind of more changes around the edges, you know, um, and that, that's where you'll expect more species changes to occur. Yeah, um, there does tend to be, um, I've noticed some of those patterns emerging when I'm flipping through some of the species. Um, you know, you can often see it in the environment where there's a lot of um, topographic variation. You, you sort of see those those areas of big changing, big changes emerging. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that would be really interested to look, interesting to look at and to dive in a bit deeper. Um, also, I think that that hopefully that these models could be useful to identify those areas where it's predicting those changes that, you know, that might be a good place to go out and monitor. You know, Jenny mentioned one of the, the things that we know people are faced with is that there just isn't enough money to do monitoring, and so we want to make that as efficient as, as possible. So hopefully, you know, you might use these models to help identify those ecotone areas that are predict, predicted to have change and maybe um, – uh, go out and monitor and make that monitoring a little more efficient. So. Yeah, seems like it to me. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks. So, Sam, Sam you've provided your. Wondering if you could get um, um, the URLs for those the test um, things that we went through in the in the Tucson meeting, so that we could maybe put those on the Desert LCC website along with the. The, Absol absolutely. The YouTube yeah. presentation. 
that we're yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, then then folks could could give it a whirl. Yep. That would Perfect. be great. And and Sam, you've provided your email address here on this last slide. Are you willing to uh, take que additional questions from folks? Absolutely. That's why I stuck it up there front and center. <laughs> I'm That's always great. happy to to talk or or you know take a phone call. Great. Well, um, we're out of time, folks. Um, I want to thank um, Sam very much for making time to be with us today and, and tell us about this great project. And I want to thank you all for your great questions and, and for making time to be here as well. We will be posting this webinar to the Desert LCC's YouTube channel um, probably by sometime next week. So you can look, at, look for it there if you want to share it with folks or you want to revisit what was presented today. So with that, um, I will say thank you, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks thank a lot, you. everyone. Thanks, Sam.